What's up, y'all? I'm here with my buddies Jean-Baptiste and Buzz. So as you can see, we have some cameras here set up for a little video. We got my trusty Ursa Mini Pro G2 I've been using for years now. Jean-Baptiste here is a bougie little red user. And we got Buzz here. He's a friggin' Sony conformist. No, nah, I'm just kidding. We are actually surrounded by some great tech here with the privilege of shooting with some uh, big boy toy cameras. What we're doing today is we're seeing these three different cinema setups that probably range anywhere in $10,000 to see what pro level cinema, rig, whatever you want to call it, what's appropriate for you when it's your time to buy some pro gear and make some bigger, better projects. Now, disclaimer, your camera does not tell your story. You tell the story. Cameras are just tools to help you make the stories you want to make. And these three cameras have very different functionalities. So while we will be looking at dynamic range, color science, workflow, and all that, what's most important is the functionality of these cameras, what it's like to shoot with them, and how they are gonna execute your stories. So, let's get into it. All right. This was a fun one. I had the very rare opportunity of having some friends that had some pretty high level gear. But before we really get into the meat and potatoes of this video, I, I cannot stress the disclaimer enough. This is not flex time. Between the three of us in this video, we've had years and years and years of experience. We saved up money, we did the hard work, and we were able to get ourselves some pro level gear that fit the level of work we were getting. But even still, us three, we believe in the philosophy that the best camera you got, well, that's just it, the camera you got. Whether that's an FX3, an old Canon, a Blackmagic Pocket, and not something like an Ursa, the Red Komodo, or the FX6 or FX9 or whatever, we still hold true to the fact that gear is just here to support us, not create us. But there is enough differences and intricacies in gear that one camera might not be the best for you. So let's get back to the field work take a look at what some of these cameras can do and go through my opinions of the cameras, I would highly encourage you to check out the other social media channels of the two guys in this video, which are Jean-Baptiste and Buzz. They're gonna have a completely different mindset when it comes to gear, whether that's the Red, the Sony, or the Black Magic. There is no right answer, there's only the answer that you decide. And hopefully this video will help you narrow that down. We simply just did a couple shots here and we did the same movements and settings for each shot. Warning though, we handicapped the living crap out of Jean-Baptiste on this one because the Red Komodo does not have internal ND filters. And that's something to keep in mind. And we made sure to use similar or the same lenses on all of these shots. In fact, every shot either utilized a Sigma 18 to 35 or a Sigma 24 to 70 so that we can utilize the full frame sensor of the FX6 because the 18 to 35 does not fit a full frame sensor. The Sony FX6, I'm not gonna lie, I think it was pretty nice. I am a known Sony hater. I have, or at least I have been a known Sony hater in the days of the FS7, the FS5, and the A7 lineup when it was just the A7 II. But getting to use something like an FX3 and an FX6 recently, I may be converting. You can't deny the conveniences that come with the FX6. The auto ND, the auto focus in a cinema camera that actually works well. Still, the look is, it's good. It's a good look. Yeah, I've always believed that Sony tends to lean a little bit into the greens and a different kind of feel for me, but it, it's still just a good look. It was slightly lighter, can't deny that. And the conveniences, once again, those were dope. And it has all the other accoutrements of a documentary camera, such as the XLR inputs. Granted, has to be on the top handle. 
that's something the Ursa doesn't have to worry about. It's built into the camera. FX6, you have to use the top handle. And the, you know, the, the, the menu isn't too bad, but it does remind me of like the older, like Sony DSLR type menus or, you know, it's not for me, but if I'm about to not buy a camera because of the menu, I might have different issues. You could easily make the argument that it is in fact the best documentary camera on the market. Of all the three cameras, the red was the one that was the least built out when you buy the thing. You really have to go out of your way to build it out to be a proper cinema rig. Now, although we did handicap the crap out of Jean-Baptiste with shooting this, it was pretty fun to go into red raw and actually mess around with the footage to bring it back to what ours looked like in that harsh sunlight. And that's the biggest pro for me with the red Komodo, the red raw Kodak. For those of you that don't know, RAW is a patent that is owned by RED. Now, I'm not caught up to the news on whether or not that patent is going to change and become more open source soon. It might. But for all intents and purposes, they own RAW. Every other flavor of RAW you know is like third party or like some other entity's like version of it. If you are somebody who is only doing cinematography, you're not worried about sound, you're not worried about, you know, YouTube or like, how you can fully utilize your camera and you're just DPing, the Red Komodo is not a bad idea. But you gotta remember, all the I.O. you have to get yourself, you have to build out this camera, and it takes a lot to build it out to something like a documentary camera or a one-man band type camera. It's tough, it's doable, but it's tough. As for my big baby Ursa, I mean, I'll tell you, I've grown to love this thing a lot. I have a hard time finding cons with it, but there are two major cons. One, she thick. I'm getting to the point where I am just destroying my friggin' arms every time I use this camera and it hurts like a bitch. The other con is the low light, which, and I would say maybe, you know, every now and then I find myself a scenario where I'm just like, damn man, I can't shoot. I just can't, there's no light. But there's a difference between shooting in no light and shooting in low light. And I think a lot of people get that a little misconstrued. If I have, at least one decent light source, I can get away with some stuff with the Ursa. But overall, when you're posting to YouTube, I think that's a small sacrifice to make until the image breaks at least. Once you get fixed pattern noise, which is something I've dealt with with the Ursa, that's game over. You can't fix that. And of course, I love the friggin' Blackmagic user interface. It is the most user-friendly thing I've used in my life. I could hand that camera to a cat and they'd probably figure out how to shoot in Blackmagic RAW in five seconds. I find that to be a solid documentary camera, but leaning a little more towards the cinema space because of that color space that it's able to capture. For me, the looks I want are so easily captured by the Ursa. I love Blackmagic RAW. I love the Ursa sensor. And although the low light isn't that great, who gives a crap? If I'm doing a movie, I'm gonna have light source or I'm gonna have logistical planning. Whatever comes first. Now, overall, dynamic range wise, I think all these cameras are nominally, they're the same. Yeah, if you wanted to go into the, the scopes a little more and you wanted to compare highlights a little bit, I would say when in doubt, I'm going with the Ursa every time. But then I got to think, you know, how much am I actually saving in data wise when it comes to my highlights and my shadows? So that's more or less our look on these three cameras, at least from my aspect. So I hope that you maybe caught a little tidbit there and there about these three things. And maybe this will help you out down the line when it's time to buy your first prosumer camera at whatever the five to $10,000 range. But no matter what, just remember, there is no perfect answer. You need to look at gear as the support system that it is. Look into the functionalities. Do you need onboard sound? Do you need XLR inputs? Does autofocus sound like something for you because you do a lot of fast moving projects in sports? Do you want something like the color science of the Ursa because you lean more towards the cinema space and you want that flexibility and the DaVinci Resolve that comes with the camera? Just saying. Or you're somebody that works maybe strictly commercials and all you do is cinematography and you just want to do cinematography. So something like the red might be a little more appeasing to you. You need to ask yourself all of these questions before you hit checkout on B&H. Don't let color science and the look of the camera be the main driving force. Let that just be another tick on the Venn diagram, just like everything else. There's a lot of thought that goes into making a purchase for one of these cameras, and you do not want to regret it. So do your research, rent it if you have to, 
hit up a buddy that's willing to let you shoot with it and make the right decision for you. There is no perfect camera choice. There's only the one that you decide for yourself as the storyteller. The YouTube videos will be cooking now. If you have any suggestions for what you want to see for the channel or what we do in the future, throw it down in the comments and I will be more than happy to have a conversation with you. Thank you for watching. Again, love you all for the constant support. Goodbye. What's up, y'all? We're doing a camera test today because we're rich and you're poor.